Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You know, several of the people that Jesus touched, man, they wanted to travel with him right on the spot. They were ready to walk off from everything and travel with him. And he sent them home. And he said, go home and show them what great things I've done for you. You know what? If it don't work at home, then it's broke. Go home and show them. Show them what I've done for you. Go home and show them. If you've been a nightmare, go home and be peaceful for a couple of years and see what that does for your family. Get a spirit-filled personality and become a body just wholly filled and flooded with God. That'll get some attention. When God touched my life, I didn't have to run around and try to tell everybody that I'd been touched. They started asking me, what's different about you? What's going on with you? You're acting different than you used to. Let's let our personalities be a dispenser for the Holy Spirit. Now, this has hand lotion in it. This is a dispenser and has hand lotion in it. So I go up. Whew, there you go. Got just what I wanted right out of there. Got me some hand lotion. Now, what if I would have done that? Man, it even smells good. What if I would have done that and got black grease? <laughs> so let me ask you a question. What happens when people push you a little bit? What are they getting? They're getting some love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, gentleness, humility, self-control. What happens when our fruit is squeezed? Are we just kind of like one of those oranges that's been ripened under gas somewhere and it looks beautiful in the store and when you go cut it open it's just a dried up mess? Uh-oh, I tell you, we're going deep tonight. <laughs> Let's look at Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now in Haran, the Lord said to Abram, Go for yourself, for your own advantage, away from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Now, Sometimes, folks, you just can't grow in God if you don't get away from some stuff. So I'm just going to just leave that there with you for a little bit. You know? <laughs> oh, man, I could say some stuff, but I better be careful. <laughs> okay, I will. You know what, now let me just preempt this by saying this. I don't care, I don't care what denomination you belong to as long as they've got good solid doctrine. This is not about my denomination, your denomination. But I'm going to say this, if you're in a dead church, don't be expecting to grow while you're there. Well, I don't want to hurt mama's feelings. You know, sometimes if you really want to have the power of God in your life, you've got to make some unpopular decisions. We do too much to please people, and then we end up very unpleased and even bitter and resentful because we feel like everybody else has stolen our life. Enough said. Just, if you want to have life, then you can't be hanging out with dead stuff. We're going to talk about... We're going to talk about dead stuff a little bit more here in a minute. But So, actually, a lot of Abram's family was idol worshipers, and that's why God said, you've got to get away from there. <laughs> now, in Haran, the Lord said to Abram, go for yourself. He said, this is for you. For your own advantage, from your relatives, your father's house, the land that I will show you. Now, watch this. And I will make of you a great nation. 
and I will bless you with an abundant increase of favors, and I will make your name famous and distinguished, and you will become a blessing dispensing good to others. You become like a Holy Ghost dispensary And you can just pray that somebody will push your button so the Holy Spirit will pop out at them. <laughs> Let me ask again, what do people get when they push you? Now, the Bible uses the phraseology, put on and put off. And I really love to teach on this because both of those are action words. It's not, not just something that happens. It says, put on Christ. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. These are decisions that we make about how we're going to behave. But now let me just quickly say this before we go any further. No matter what kind of decision I make or you make, it's not going to work if it's not energized and backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't ever want to come across like I'm just saying, this is what you need to do, and boy, you just need to go home and do it. What you, what, yes, we need to do those things, but we cannot do them without him. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why we must really depend on the Holy Spirit who has come to live in close fellowship with us. Listen, we've got all the help we need living on the inside of us. I said, you have got all the help you need living on the inside of you. Matter of fact, let me just go ahead and tell you, if you've got some kind of an addictive bondage in your life, you have got the help that you need to resist it on the inside of you. You do. Yes, you do. No, I can't. I can't. Stop saying you can't. And start saying I can. The power of the Holy Ghost is in my life to enable me to do what I need to do. I can do it not by myself, but through Christ I can do what I need to do. And you know what? The moment that you believe, really believe, and stop living in fear that that thing's got power over you, the moment you believe, you'll be free from it. The moment you really believe. Close fellowship. Close fellowship. So I'm going to read you actually three scriptures here that talk to us about our behavior. But I want to make it very clear that you can't behave, and I can't behave the way the Bible tells us to without this wonderful power of the Holy Spirit having full reign in our lives. So Colossians 3, 12 through 14. So what this is talking about is we need to be covered spiritually. We need to be clothed spiritually. The same way you put on physical clothes, you need to put on spiritual clothing. And the way you do that really, for me, I think it's just through making some decisions and asking God to back it up with his power. Make a decision, ask God to back it up with his power. God can't do anything through you if you don't make a choice because we have the right of free choice. Amen? The power of choice is an amazing thing. So he says, clothe yourselves as God's own chosen ones, his own picked representatives who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God himself by putting on behavior <laughs> marked by tender-hearted pity Mercy, kind feelings, a lowly opinion of yourself. And that doesn't mean like thinking you're no good. That just means humility. Gentle ways, patience, which is tireless and long-suffering. And I love this part. And has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. Wow. <laughs> Be gentle and forbearing with one another. And if one has a difference, a grievance, or a complaint against another, readily pardoning each other even as the Lord has freely forgiven you so you must also forgive and above all these things put on love put on Colossians 3 8 and 9 just bear with me a minute but now put away and rid yourselves completely of all of these things anger rage bad feelings toward others curses slander foul mouth abuse shameful utterances from your lips don't lie to each other for you have stripped off the old unregenerate self with its evil practices and you have now clothed yourself with the new spiritual man. So we see this put off the old stuff, put on the new stuff, 
And for me, I think it's just as simple as reading the word and saying, you know, I agree with that, God, and I'm not willing to keep acting that way. I'm deciding to act this way. But then I go right to God and say, but we both know that I cannot do it without you. And so whatever success I have today, you're going to get the credit. And where I fail, I'm going to take the blame. <laughs> And I probably won't hit it 100% today, but I'm going to get up again tomorrow and give it another go, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and you're going to keep changing me from glory to glory until we're finally transformed into His image. Don't have leaves, have fruit. I hope somebody in the building is feeling even a little bit convicted. Now... You know, the Apostle Paul made this statement that just still just boggles my brain. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, how many of us would be comfortable saying to all of our friends, if you act like me, you're going to be in good shape? <laughs> we really should be able to say that. <laughs> I mean, we really should be able to say that. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 12, that we are to be a pattern for other people to follow. <laughs> a pattern in faith, a pattern in conduct. Watch me and I'll show you what it means to be a Christian. Come on, you out there tonight? Just watch me and I'll show you what it means to have Christ in your life. Watch this victory. Look at this good fruit. And especially when you used to be a nightmare and now people see the change in your life, you can't argue with that. <laughs> to be honest, if you're just really a mess, you should rejoice because now God's got a lot of great things He can do that'll shock everybody. <laughs> now, you are anointed. Every single person who has Christ as their Savior, is anointed. You have an anointing of the Holy Ghost on your life. And that anointing translates into power, enablement, ability, efficiency, and might. You have power. Holy Ghost oomph. And that anointing, where there's an anointing, there's life. Now, we need to get a little better at discerning when something's dead. <laughs> because if it's dead, that means God's not in it. Or God's not on it. That's why the Bible talks about dead works. Dead works are works of our flesh. It's us trying to do what only God can do. It's me saying, I can do that. Dead works was like when Abram and Sarah decided since she wasn't getting pregnant that, she should, that Abram should now take her handmaid and they had this concocted this crazy plan that just did nothing but cause them problems for years and years and years. That's called a work of the flesh, a dead work. <laughs> dead works wear us out and never give us the result we're looking for. Did you hear me? Dead works wear us out and never give us the result that we're looking for. If something is of God, even though you may go through a period of standing firm, it will ultimately work. If it is of God, it will work. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 10.1. I don't think in all the years I've taught I've ever used this scripture, so... But I thought it was kind of cool for this message tonight. Dead flies cause the ointment of the perfumer to putrefy and send forth, forth a vile odor. Okay, now, you know, ointment is just another word for anointing. And actually, the anointing oil that was poured on the priests and the prophets in the Old Testament was a perfume, was oil mixed with all these spices that turned it into this sweet-smelling perfume. So let's just look at it like this. 
Dead stuff causes the anointing <laughs> to be hindered and everything in our life starts to stink. Come on, let's get rid of the dead flies. Let's don't let it mess up our anointing, amen? Come on. All right, now. Are you able to discern when the anointing is present and when it's not? That is so valuable to us. Because to be honest, somebody can put on a slick show and there not be one ounce of anointing there. Do you hear me? Don't be so overly impressed by just all the outward stuff. You make sure there's fruit and look for life and look for the anointing. It's something anointed. I don't care how polished it is. If it's not anointed, it's not going to do you any good. We're going to have the anointing. When somebody preaches to you under the anointing, it penetrates and goes in and makes a change in your life. But it must be anointed. Jesus said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. Now, we need to get good enough to realize when there's been a, a decline in the anointing on our life, other things we might be dealing with. We have to get sensitive to knowing, is there something not right here that I need to maybe get a little handle on? Let's look at Luke chapter 2 for just a minute. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year to the Passover feast. It's talking about Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as was their custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but now his parents did not know it. <laughs> so... Jesus wasn't with them anymore, and they didn't know it. Wow. I pray, God, that I'm never in a situation where he's not with me, and I don't know it. Come on. I mean, our society is full of churches that Jesus himself wouldn't go to. Now, there's a lot of great churches, a lot of wonderful churches, wonderful, wonderful pastors. I strongly advocate being plugged into a good local church. You need that connection. You need that commitment. You need that pastoral oversight. You need the accountability, accountability of a body of believers. All I'm asking is that you go to one that's alive, where you can grow and flourish and serve and maybe get your bottom smacked a little bit if you get out of line. Come on, that's all right too. They didn't know it. Verse 44, but supposing him to be in the caravan. Now you see, this is where we make our mistake if we just assume and presume and suppose that he's with us. But oops, <laughs> where's Jesus? They traveled on a day's journey, thinking he was with them. <laughs> and then they sought him diligently, looking up and down for him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. When they failed to find him, they now went back to Jerusalem, looking for him up and down. Now, I'm just kind of throwing out some tidbits here. You know, sometimes you got to go back to the place where you lost what you had. Okay. Now, you know, just to say I've said it so I don't get anybody telling me I got bad doctrine, obviously we don't lose Jesus. What I'm talking about, I mean, we really don't even lose the anointing because the Bible says it abides on us and is here to stay. But we can have greater measures of the anointing or less measures of the anointing. We can have greater power or less power in our life depending on how we live. Because the Bible makes it clear that God will not anoint the flesh. Did you hear me? No anointing oil was poured on the flesh. 
So if I'm just carnal and walking in the flesh, God's not going to anoint that. Where I sent picture, find the anointing is when I begin to behave like him. So they thought, they assumed he was there. He wasn't. They've gone on a day, didn't have him. Now all of a sudden they're realizing, whoop, something's wrong. Jesus ain't here. So now they had to go back to where they thought maybe they left him. <laughs> all right, now watch this because I think this is worth mentioning too. Verse 45, and when they failed to find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him up and down all the way. Now watch this. And after three days, they found him. Now, I'm just going to make this point. You can do with what you want. They lost him in one day. It took them three days to find him. <laughs> in other words, it's easier to lose our power than it is to get it back once we give it up. And that's not meant to frighten anybody. It's just meant to say, let's value what we have. Let's treat it precious. Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let's not quench the Holy Spirit. I don't want to give up what I've got because I don't want to go through the work of trying to get it back. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Listen, I know what it's like to preach under the anointing, and I know what it's like to not preach under the anointing. It's only happened to me maybe four or five times in my life, but they were good lessons for me. And I want to tell you something, when I start looking at my watch, hoping it's going to be over soon, I'm in trouble. Uh, one more example, Samson. <laughs> Boy, Samson had a case of power gone sour. really kind of sad what happened to him. We're almost done. Judges 15, verses 14 and 15. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. <laughs> and the ropes on his arms became as flax that had caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a still, moist, jawbone of a donkey and reached out and took it and with that one jawbone of a donkey he killed 1,000 men with it <laughs> all because of the anointing I mean with Moses God anointed a stick and he parted the Red Sea with it I'm just telling you you don't have much I mean all you don't have to have much all God said to Moses was what's in your hand if I anoint what's in your hand man watch out are you there? So Samson was supernaturally strong because God's special anointing was on his life. And he had been told that he had to take the vow of a Nazarite, and that meant that he could not cut his hair. And so the enemy, of course, sent a woman after him to tempt him to try to find out his secret of his strength. Her name was Delilah, and sure enough, he caved in and finally told her what the secret was, and while he was sleeping, she cut his hair. And now let's look at chapter 16, verse 20. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Now, she's there with him. She's cut his hair. He doesn't know that his strength is gone. He doesn't know that the anointing is gone. And it is gone because he did what God told him not to do. <laughs> the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as I have done time after time and shake myself free. For Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Wow. You know what? What got him in trouble was, first of all, he disobeyed God. And then he, see it said, he just, he just woke up and thought, well, I'll just go do what I've done before. <laughs> you can't just assume because you were good at it last week that you're going to be good at it today. <laughs> and sometimes when people have a lot of power and a lot of influence, now just think about this. They're being successful. Samson had power. He had influence. He was being successful. 
Sometimes they start to think that they can just do whatever they want to and God's power will still stay with them. But it don't work that way. If you got power, don't end up with power gone sour someday. Stay strong in God. Keep depending on Him all the way through. And the more successful you are, the more you need to depend on God because success in itself is a temptation to draw you away from God. You know, we need to really value the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives by walking with Him and letting Him lead us in every single area of life. I want you to meet my buddy, Angela. She is seven years old. She's very, very ticklish. We've been able to make an impact in Angela and her family's life after a very devastating loss. You see, we're here in Zambia and water is a huge need here. Even though we are right along the banks of the Zambezi River where you think water would be plentiful, but that water is extremely dangerous. And Angela lost one of her sisters to a crocodile along the river as they were gathering water. If you can even imagine such a loss as a parent, as a sister, to lose someone that you love in such a terrible way. This is the biggest river in Zambia. So there were a lot of problems. There are a lot of crocodiles in the river. There are a lot of hippos in the river. The most affected people are their children. Uh, I lost my daughter, caught by the crocodile. I sent her to go and fetch water. How old was she? Ten years. Ten years old? Yes. Every time we, uh, we fetch water from that side, we, di we drink it direct without uh, putting any chemical in it. As you can see, this is, these are just villages. They don't have uh, money to buy chlorine or any chemical to purify water. So uh, we had uh, uh, diseases like uh, dysentery, diarrhea, of uh, waterborne diseases. We were crying for clean water. How many people would you say were, were sick from waterborne illness during that time? There were many. If you, even if you go to the clinic there, they'll give you the number. The people were suffering from this diarrhea and so forth. <laughs> now we are happy. We are drinking clean water. We are living a better life now. Now we are getting good water, safe water. Yes, even crocodiles are no more accident for crocodiles. We thank you very much for what you are doing. And people are healthier. Yes, very much. This ball which is set here, it's not from, uh, from you. It's not from hand of hope itself, but it's from God himself. So they thank, they thank God for bringing hand of hope, to bring all that support all the way to here. It is safe, madam. We are happy on that. And all the people now are very happy. Praise to God. God loves us. Thank you. So now as Edith and her three girls are gathering water, they don't have to be in fear. They don't have to be in fear of the dangers of the river, of the animals, of the disease that the water carries. And we are so grateful that you have been right here with us to provide this for them. It's through your love for Christ and it's in sharing that love with Edith, her girls, and the entire village in this area that you are changing the world one little bit at a time.